Hey, it's Juck. Today, Notre Dame, Michigan, and Alabama fans not happy with the Juck on Bucks take on college football traditions. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically, but it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. To start, that means we've got. And welcome in on a Wednesday morning. So happy to have you guys here with me. Yesterday, I put out a list of, it wasn't really a list. I was responding to a list. Somebody else made a list. And I think that ranking traditions, they're, they're, they're different categories. You know, you've got games, you've got um, animal traditions, you've got traditions that are hype songs, and then you've got your classic traditions like Script Ohio. They're just all different categories. So I kind of just went through all of the various traditions and added some that weren't on the list and just kind of weighed in on how I felt about each tradition. And then I just kind of named what my favorite was, which is the Penn State whiteout. Uh, I, I just, for my money, I think it's the most um, awe-inspiring. It's one that actually affects the game uh, points-wise. Being a visitor in that atmosphere, I, I think, adds points to Penn State. And uh, it, it's just it's just amazing to me. And there's a lot of other amazing ones, and I went over those as well. And then I went over the ones that I thought were overrated and I didn't feel belonged in a top 10 list. Ones like Sweet Home Alabama playing at, at Alabama games at Brian Denny and adding in Roll Tide Roll. I think that is very boring and not super unique. I mean, the name of the song is Sweet Home Alabama. It's There's nothing unique about it. There's nothing cool about it. It's uh, it's very, it's a layup. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's an absolute layup to play that song and add Roll Tide Roll into it. So, uh, you know, no points for creativity. The Notre Dame sign, which I do think is cool. I like it. But the fact that it's only been there since the Lou Holtz era, it's just not... It's not uh, it's not old enough. It's so much about Notre Dame is about all the history and how old it is. Something from the Lou Holtz era doesn't qualify for me. It just doesn't. Uh, you know, it's a cool sign. I like the look of it. I like the way it's painted. It looks like it's from the 1920s, but it's not. And in fact, I think that that is quite fraudulent. I think it's intentionally made to look like it's from the 1920s when it's from the Lou Holtz era, and. I believe that it is fraudulent, just like so many other things about Notre Dame. So I'm not backing off either of those. That's just what it is. As far as Mr. Brightside, man, <laughs> they don't like when I talk about him, but nobody had a single thing to say to defend Mr. Brightside. Uh, in 2016, the game director of presentation said, let's sing this song. They sang that song, latched onto it. That was it. That's not a good tradition. When a director of presentation says, guys, let's try this, and everybody does it, um, that's, uh, th that's garbage. That's not a good tradition. It's not organic. It's just cheesy. There's no tie-in to the school. There's nothing about it that's, that's unique. I guess there is a tie-in to the school that the guy's talking about his girlfriend cheating. Um, so there is a tie-in, but not the one they think there is. But It's just boring. It's boring, and it's corny, and it's cheesy, and there's no energy to it. I actually kind of like it, to be honest. I do like it. It does sound cool. I like to see all those people singing in unison. Um, it sounds really cool when they turn the music down at the end and they sing the final verse together. Okay, I think it's pretty cool. I like it. However, there's nothing great about it. It's just neat to listen to. And that's like so many of these, right? We're talking about good traditions. I mean, there's things that you can do that are fun at a school, but something that you started in 2016 from a game director that's not even a tradition yet it's 2016 come on now get out of here with the nonsense everybody's so sensitive man half the time i'm just clowning half the time i'm serious but half the time i'm clowning um people get so angry man I, that's what i love about college football you know you got to expect that when you put out when you just kind of put yourself out there right like i used to used to say these things on twitter and I say the same things I say on Twitter on here, but for some reason on here, it gets much more of a reaction. Just me speaking the words on the, on the screen. People see it and get angry. 
boy, on, on TikTok, man, those ones are rabid. They're nasty on the TikTok. But, uh, you know, hey, I'm just having fun, guys. I'm just having fun. We're having a good time. It's college football. And uh, I hate y'all if you don't wear the scarlet and gray. And you hate me, too. And that's cool. We should embrace that. But it doesn't need to be so nasty. You know, we can have it with a smile, right? The, uh, the odds came out for the conference championships. And I was, uh, you know, a couple surprises. But all in all, everything looks pretty much like we would think. The Buckeyes, uh, the look-ahead line for the Buckeyes heading out to Eugene is the Buckeyes getting one and a half points. Um, I don't like uh, I don't like being an underdog. It makes me feel uneasy. But at the same time, I think it allows the guys, I, I think the guys on the team like being underdogs. So rare are they ever underdogs. And whenever they are, they seem to come out with a chip on their shoulder. Uh, and technically, you know, if you put that on a neutral field, they're really not underdogs. And honestly, Autzen is a really tough place to play. I don't think it's your standard three-point home advantage for a big game. I, I think it's probably more like four. So really, they're saying on a neutral field, the Buckeyes would be favored by just a couple of points. I agree with that. I think the Buckeyes are a couple points better. And, you know, one and a half point dogs heading out there. It is what it is. But the Michigan-Ohio State line is Buckeyes by nine and a half. That's a pretty massive look ahead line. Uh, the current odds to win the Big Ten came out here. Uh, we're looking at Ohio State at plus 165, Oregon at plus 210. And that is tight. That's really tight. I think that uh, the most interesting here, interesting thing here is Penn State and Michigan being tied at plus 550. That's surprising. I wasn't expecting that. I don't know what anybody's seen in Penn State here, and I got to think that this is just strictly related to scheduling. Penn State plays Ohio State, but no Michigan, no Oregon. Then they play USC, Washington, and Wisconsin. So a much easier schedule than Michigan, who plays Texas, Oregon, Ohio State, USC, and Washington. Um, but the Penn State offense... Are they going to be able to move the ball? Is Oller going to get any better this year? I saw him throwing with his quarterback coach. Man, that dude throws a pretty ball. Uh, he looks like he's gained about 10, 15 pounds, too. He looks pretty stacked. I'm rooting for him. He's an Ohio kid. I kind of like him. He's a good dude from pretty close here to me here. Uh, I'm clearly pretty much, high, much higher on uh, USC than most people here. That's a massive gap between them and Penn State. I kind of thought that them and Penn State would be quite a bit closer here, but that's really big. Um, are they going to be able to improve enough on defense to be competitive in this league? They have a tough schedule. Uh, they got a whole slew of new defensive coaches in there. And them, much like um, much like LSU, who's bringing in a new defensive coordinator, the one for, that was at Missouri, can one of those guys come in and do a Jim Knowles kind of patch-up job? LSU has some more talent for the new guy to work with down there, and I think he's a little more established as a defensive coordinator. Uh, USC's guy is from UCLA, but they also got a bunch of stud. stud. Uh, they got one, uh, the defensive tackle or the defensive line coach from the Rams. He's really good. So they got some good guys. I don't think they got the talent there to quite do that patch-up job, but I still think they'll be quite a bit better than they were last year. Um, Alex Grinch is out there doing interviews, working for Luke Fickle. I mean, I don't know what Fickle's thinking here. How do you, how do you feel as a Wisconsin fan? All excited about Luke Fickle, and he brings in Alex Grinch. After USC fans and, and really the whole media was clowning Lincoln Riley for the last two years for still having that guy around, he finally gets rid of him, and Fickle brings him in. I don't know. Got to question that decision from Luke and. I certainly want what's best for the Badgers. I, 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 I am really rooting hard for Fickle to be able to turn that around and become a tier 1A coach. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to see them be that, be where the Penn State is. I would like to see Wisconsin be that team instead of Penn State or, or instead of Michigan. I would love to see Wisconsin be a better team under Fickle. I really root for him. Obviously, um, I don't, I don't want to see him ever get too good, and they can't. They have a talent limit cap at Wisconsin. 
But, you know, if, if it's going to be Penn State or Wisconsin in that spot, I'd much rather it be Wisconsin under Fickle. Um, and who's to say? He may be our coach someday. But hiring, hiring Alex Grinch was a very puzzling decision to me. Um, Iowa, I thought that was a pretty fair number for Iowa. But remember, their, their win total is my bet of the year, over seven and a half. There are four games that they won't be favored in. Ohio State, Washington, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. They can lose all four. We still cash, and I think they'll pick one of those guys off. So Iowa, that's the bet. Win total over seven and a half. Let's take a look at the SEC. All right. Over to God's conference here. Uh, I know that Alabama's number at plus 950 is about to get hammered because the general public cannot seem to get it through their head that uh, Alabama is at plus 950. I mean, that's that's going to be changing real quick here. That is, uh, that's pretty wild. I, I would have thought they would have got that public bump. But like I said, LSU bringing in uh, that defensive coordinator from Missouri, who's really, really good, and with you know enough decent raw pieces for him to be able to maybe pull a Jim Knowles kind of patch up job year one. Uh, Garrett Nussmeyer at quarterback is looking really sharp. He looked great in the spring game. He's experienced. I think that LSU could make a little more noise than some people are thinking. But uh, Brian Kelly had some thoughts today that we're going to go over here in a second. Um, Tempting here, uh, Ole Miss at plus 650. That's a tempting bet there. Ole Miss might jump up and surprise them this year. And I was thinking that uh, Texas might be the, the team I was going to pick to win the conference. I don't think so anymore because I just heard Sarkeesian talking about his defensive line. We had some questions about that defensive line. They lost the bigs in the middle. And he said that he is not comfortable with, with, with the bigs in the middle right now. They don't have enough big humans. So if that's coming from him and he's going to say that publicly, I'm assuming that those problems are pretty doggone big. And that's a spot you need big humans when you play in the SEC. So I am going to stick with Georgia for my pick here. It's super chalky and boring, but, you know, I, I just – Ole Miss, Texas, I think they're real close. They are real close. And LSU might surprise us, but – Still going to go ahead and pick Georgia. And in the ACC, this is easy money here. This is Miami all day. Now, I know you guys are going to say I'm crazy. Um, I'm going out on a limb here with this one. I, I really believe that Cade Klubnick at Clemson sucks. Dabo's going way downhill. Florida State with DG, DJ Ui Ungalalele, um, they're just not good enough. They're not good enough. Miami has has a better roster now than Florida State, I think, and not quite as good as Clemson, but I, I think that they have a much easier schedule. So the game with Florida State and Clemson is in Florida State this year, and I think the championship game is going to be Miami versus Florida State, and Miami is going to win the ACC. Uh, I know it's crazy. I get it. But the schedule sets up beautifully for Miami to get to the championship game. And if they get to the championship game, they stack up very well with Cam Ward under center against either one of those guys. And I am certainly uh, becoming a believer in Cam Ward. Everything I'm seeing out of that spring camp, his attitude, he is, listen, he's, he's really, uh, when he was going to enter the NFL and then he decided not to, I talked a lot of crap about him. I'm like, this guy, this just seems like he was trying to go to the NFL he didn't get the draft grade he wanted. They pulled him out with a bunch of money. And I'm like, this guy, yeah, I don't have a good feeling about him. Uh, but I, I'm starting to get a much better feeling about him. And they just cleaned up again in the spring portal. And uh, the, the roster stacked. It's absolutely loaded. This is all going to come down to can Mario Cristobal just not screw up and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here based on absolutely nothing other than I think he is a very smart guy. Um, I think his team really believes in him. I love that he's kind of a disciplinarian. He's, he's, he's the type of guy we've never seen at Miami. And it is a national nightmare for Miami to be good at football again. Their fans are obnoxious and an absolute nightmare. But I'm kind of a believer. I'm kind of a believer. And they are my pick to win the ACC. Florida State as the runner-up. 
Now, maybe the conference that has become like quickly, maybe the, the well, it's definitely the most competitive conference in football. The Big 12 is so competitive and it is so fun because you got a bunch of schools that are kind of second-ish tier schools. And now without Oklahoma and Texas, there's nobody there to beat up everybody else. They're all so evenly matched and they all invest in football. They all really want to be good at football and they play different brands of football. You got some tough, physical, very old school, big 10 looking teams like Kansas State and Utah. And you got some open it up, wide open teams like Texas Tech, Arizona. Um, there's some good quarterbacks. There's some good coaches. It's a very interesting conference. And, you know, again, here I'm going to go out on a little limb and I'm going to choose Kansas State to win the Big 12 and Lance Leopold to cash in with Jalen Daniels coming back. Uh, I, I am a believer in what they got going on at Kansas State. I love Kyle Whittingham, but I just think that the momentum that Lance Leopold has created at Kansas is going to be cashed in this year. And I'm going to go with Kansas winning the Big 12. So those are my picks. Now, I really think that Lance Leopold, who is now making $7 million a year at Kansas, which is just insane to think about that commitment that Kansas has now put into football. Uh, I guess all it took was to get a coach in there to make him realize, hey, we can actually do it here with the right guy. Lance Leopold's a little older, now making $7 bucks a year. I'm starting to get the, the, the Dan Lanning feel about him staying where he's put. I, I don't think that he's going to jump at a big job when he gets the opportunity. He's just kind of a different dude. He seems really happy. He's kind of old. And I, I just think he's going to try to find his ceiling there. And when he finds it, he might just be okay with it. Kind of like Kyle Whittingham was at Utah. It's, uh, you know, it's not that crazy. I think we always think that somebody's going to jump as soon as they become that hot name. You know, you look at Matt Campbell at Iowa State. Matt Campbell, when uh, Urban stepped down, Matt Campbell was, was a name a lot of people were thinking that they should talk to. Um, and now he looks like a very mid coach. Boy, that could have been a disaster. I still like him, though. I mean, who knows how good of a coach he is. He's at Iowa State. You know what I mean? I, I like what he's done with that program. He seems like a really genuine dude. He's from Mount Union. So I like everything about him. But, you know, I, I think he probably should have taken the jump when he had the shot there. We got some uh, top 25 to talk about, a couple of them to go over. So Joel Klatt released his top 25. Let's take a look at what Joel Klatt from Fox Sports has going on here. So Joel Klatt agrees with the Juck on Bucks preseason poll. And he has to say the defense for Ohio State is what makes them the number one team in the country. They'll be the best defense in the country. And I think Ohio State will have as good of a defense as we've seen in a long time, maybe going back to the 2021 Georgia team. This team has draft picks littered all over the next two drafts. They all come back. They work really hard to maintain this roster, and this defense will be an elite defense. Um, he said a lot of other things that uh, really praised the Bucs. And, you know, he's pretty tuned in, but maybe a little biased. He, he does work for Fox, and, you know, Fox is, uh, is a Big Ten pusher. There's no doubt about that. And uh, Ari Wasserman. Works for the Athletic. He's formerly of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Covered the Buckeyes on the Buckeye Beat. He uh, also put out his top twenty-five at the Athletic. He also has the Buckeyes at number one, and we're seeing this more and more. Twenty-four-seven, of course, has the Buckeyes at number one. And all you guys that told me I was crazy when I said that a month ago, uh, make sure you go at them and tell them they're all crazy too, and they're all homers. I even had our Buckeye brethren telling me that it wasn't just the Georgia fans because I did a big Georgia, Georgia, Ohio state episode. It got about 10,000 views. There's a whole lot of Georgia fans in there talking a whole lot of crap to me 
uh, about how insane I was. And, you know, I, I, I did not predict in that episode that the Buckeyes were going to beat Georgia and win the championship. I predicted, or I said, I think that they are the number one team entering the season. And now we're starting to see quite a few people that are seeing it the same way. And, uh, you know, I want to see that same energy put towards them that they had towards me. Or a couple of apologies for them that it's not just an asinine statement because they were acting like what I was saying was just ridiculous. It's clearly not ridiculous. You don't need to agree with it, but it's not ridiculous. So there we go. Uh -huh. Andrew Stargell, our main man. Andrew Stargell, lineman out of Georgia. He had an interview with 11 Warriors, and I am just liking this dude more and more. So he worked out for Justin Fry when Fry went down and visited down there. And he's got some quotes in this 11 Warriors article. He says, you can make your film look so perfect, but until you actually work out in front of the coach and you earn it yourself, it's really not that special until you do that. I felt really proud of myself for that. And it was definitely one of the greatest feelings of my life. There's obviously things I need to do to fix, things like build up my body. But Coach Fry said I can play any position, guard, tackle, or center. I was able to snap the ball. I can move. I can run. One thing he also liked was that I was very coachable. I think if I was to commit to Ohio State, I'd play center. And I like that. I got no problem with that. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the way the program at this level operates. I'm excited to grow closer relationships with all the coaches and to let them grow, 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 grow close with my family. Ohio State definitely is in my top five. Look. <laughs> Okay, they jumped they jumped a lot of people immediately. There's definitely an opportunity. You don't they're definitely an opportunity you don't push away. They're a national championship contender every year and I feel like they would develop me into a better player. Also, the fan base is unbelievable. They've been texting me all week. They're incredible. I feel like that's something like my family and I would want to be a part of for sure. So, he top 5, man, listen. This dude loves Ohio State. Absolutely loves Ohio State. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is as close to a done deal as there is. Um, this guy's going to be a Buckeye. That makes me excited. I love the way he talks. I love his attitude. We've watched him play. He, uh, he plays with a chip on his shoulder, finishes the job, plays through the whistle. Um, he's just a, he's just a madman. And this is one where it is 100% evaluation. He was ranked 825. And they went, found this guy, um, clearly overlooked, and got a hell of a lot of potential. This is a job well done, very well done. And uh, I think they'll close the deal, too, as Ohio State is by far his most appealing offer. You know, there's, he's got a lot of offers, but there's not, there's not any bigs on there yet. Though they may come calling, but, uh, you know, he seems to really, really like Ohio State. Uh, Mark Givler of Buckeye Huddle is doing his Southern Swing this year, and he caught up with uh, a couple of prospects, one of whom, David Sanders, and he had an interview with David Sanders on uh, YouTube, and it was awesome listening to David Sanders talk. I mean, talk about a mature young man, smart, uh, just thinking of him and thinking of Jordan Seaton last cycle, like night and day one's just you know he wants attention he may be a very quality player but not nearly as mature um david sanders is just a perfect prospect physically and after hearing this interview i'm just like wow this guy how exciting david sanders said he's right now he's 6'6 285 said he's a hard worker um he's definitely a very smart kid like i said maturity level off the charts he was uh He was talking about Justin Fry uh, contacting him on Tuesdays and doing Technique Tuesdays where they go over film. Um, so Justin Fry's working it from all angles. He said his family loved it at Ohio State. He wants to commit in late July or early August so he can enjoy his senior year. And he feels like the type of guy that when he commits, like it's a, an entire family decision. And those types of guys, it feels like when they commit, like that's it. The recruitment shut down. Um, we're not doing anything else. We've decided this is a family. So really exciting. 
Really exciting stuff. The Buckeyes also offered another lineman today, and he's a lineman that Chip had offered when he was out at UCLA. His name is Jackson Lloyd Caramel, and he's 6'7", 290. <laughs> My bad. His name's Jackson Lloyd. He's from Caramel, California. <laughs> Six seven two ninety. Uh, he's a four star. He is one thirty nine in the country overall, but on three has him as their twenty seventh ranked prospect. Uh, we got to do something about on three, man. One of these guys has got to. These guys got to get this crap straight. I mean, this is just insane. Uh, the variances sometimes between. 247 rivals and ESPN and then on three will be this just massive outlier. Um, and we don't have enough data on, on three to say they were right more this much percent of the time or not. It's just not there yet, but I do have some data. Now, let me get you this data here. All right. So here we go. Um, there's been a graphic floating around, and this was a pretty historic class for three-star linemen being drafted in round one, where six three-star linemen were drafted in round one and only one five-star. Um, the year prior, it was four five-stars and two three-stars. The year before that, it was two five-stars, three three-stars. So this one was pretty historic, but even in a historic year, in, in 24-7's class of 22, there were seven five-star linemen in the class. 312 three stars, which means this year's draft class, the percentage of five stars drafted in round one was 14%. The percentage of three stars drafted was just 2%. So you were seven times more likely to be drafted as a five star lineman than as a three star lineman. Um, stars matter. Like, you know, they just do. Even with linemen in a mostly developmental position, um, they matter exponentially. And, uh, you get yourself a five star. Your your odds are greater than one in seven that he's going to be an absolute stud. So, David Sanders, come on down, buddy. Um, love me some Andrew Stargell. I think he can be a big time player. Um, there's some other ones I love too that are three stars. I love a good good three star lineman. A lot of times they're really hungry, and uh, it's just a matter of picking the right one, which is the hardest thing to do, and uh, having the right guy to develop them. But you know, a guy like Sanders, again, to me, that's a once every three cycle kind of guy. Absolute monster and incredibly smart to go with it. His lifts are insane. Guys hang clean in 315 for sets of three. Just an absolute perfect prospect. Perfect. Um, Malik Autry also spoke to Mark Givler. And Malik Autry is that monster defensive tackle from uh, Alabama who came up with Ziggy Grady. Well, at the same time as Ziggy Grady, though, they did have a talk, and we'll get to that in a sec. But uh, he had a talk with Givler on uh, on YouTube, and you can watch that. He discussed his recruitment and said that both LJ and uh, Lee Allen Clark reached out to him via Twitter DM and asked if he'd be interested in Ohio State, which really surprised me. Um, I did not know that that's the way they were reaching out to a prospect. Uh, anyway, his parents seemed to really – Love the idea of him playing for Larry. It sounds like Larry really charmed their socks off. And Malik said that, uh, and Malik said that he, he was talking to, and Malik said he was talking to Zion Grady. And he said that Zion said to him, if one of us comes down, we should both come down to Ohio State. So they would like to come together. And if they did, adding in Naeem Offord, that would be three kids out of a state with two SEC schools. Um, that would be pretty cool, man. That would be pretty darn cool. Little linebacker update. James Laurinaitis was down with Keelan, Keenan Bailey at St. Xavier in Cincinnati last week, where he offered Kobe Clapper, who is a linebacker out of St. Xavier. And Kobe is one of three linebackers, uh, on the board here. That's that's not Kobe. That's Jackson Lloyd. That's the offensive lineman. We can have a look, see at him too. Really highly rated kid. Um, so Jackson Lloyd was offered. He was originally a guy that Chip offered, and he is uh, 
really good, but really big into Alabama. And it looks like they are way out in front of the lead here. Texas running number two. Uh, I think this is kind of a non-starter. But um, Storm Miller is another linebacker the Bucks are interested in. He does not have an offer. Hartline wants him to camp. Storm Miller said he talks a couple times a week to Brian Hartline, and he seems really interested. Uh, a really quality player. I watched some of his tape today. Um, I mean, you know, he looks like uh, he's a throwback. Not the fastest guy, but loves football, loves to hit. You can definitely tell he's a he's a nasty dude. His name's Storm, so that's a plus. Or is it? We we don't have the greatest memories of a storm. And sincere Johnson, who is I think he's my favorite of all these guys out of Glenville. He is uh, still waiting on his offer and he wants his offer bad. And as you can see, a very highly ranked guy, but um, Lauren Knight saw him work out last week and the offer didn't come yet. So he wants him to camp and, and sincere is going down there with the team and they are going to camp. And uh, I, I don't doubt at all that he's going to get that offer. I'd have thought he'd have had it already uh, before Kobe Clapper, to be honest, but Hey, who knows? I trust him, whatever the heck Laurenitis is doing there. No doubt about that. So Brian Kelly is uh, kind of struggling, adapting to the new era like Nick Saban did, kind of like Dabo is now. And he is uh, he's having an issue with, in my estimation, I think he's insulted about guys not wanting to open their eyes and play for LSU and get developed and instead just wanting to be paid. And he came out with a pretty strong statement in an interview about it. So the D-line, interior D-lineman, where are you right now with that? Well, I, I think I made it pretty clear in, in a number of the press conferences that I had that we were in the market uh, in recruiting uh, in the transfer portal looking for defensive linemen. It, it hasn't fared very well, quite frankly, because you know we're selling something a little bit differently, and, and that is we want to recruit uh, we, we want to engage, build relationships. We want to develop, retain, uh, and, and, have you, and have success. We're not in the market of buying players. And, and unfortunately, right now, um, you know, that's, uh, that's what some guys are looking for. They, they want to be bought. And look, I understand NIL is part of this. And, and we have an incredible collective uh, we have very, very generous opportunities around the greater Baton Rouge area for NIL opportunities. So uh, they are here, um, but we're not going to go out and buy players. That's not what this is about. This was never about that. We will develop you. We will get you ready for the next step, as we did with Jaden Daniels, as we did with Malik Neighbors, as we did with Brian Thomas. We developed three defensive linemen uh, that all got drafted uh, this year, and we'll do that again. But if you're just looking to get paid, um, you're looking in the wrong place. If you'd like all the things that we do here in developing our players, bringing you into a championship program, playing in front of the best fan base in America, playing for championships, and having an opportunity for NIL, you should be a Tiger. But if you just want to get... Um, you know, paid, this is not the place for you. This is never what it's been. No, Brian, this is never what it's been. And if you get hung up on this, like Dabo's gotten hung up on the transfer portal, when they've got money, their collective is not doing great, but it's doing fairly well. I just read something about it two weeks ago. They were having some issues and they've got their stuff together. Um, you know, if you want to take this stance, you, you got a you got a big, hard, cold dose of reality coming. Uh, I, I have no idea what it is with these guys that get so stuck in their ways that they want to stand on some kind of principle, and it's a misguided principle when the entire sport is now in on this. It's what it is. It's now legal to just straight up sign them for money. You don't have to pretend anymore. You make them an offer. The, the collectives can talk directly to the guys. You don't even have to be an involved, involved party. All you have to do is tell them who your priorities are. They can budget it out however they want. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I just don't understand this guy, he, but he's a very unlikable individual. And, and I, I just cannot understand 
how a guy like that has gotten so far in this profession because he I generally like football coaches. I, I usually find them pretty likable. This guy's a great coach. I don't know who in the heck would sign to play with him because I can't stand him. Everything about him rubs me. Just even there talking. And I agree with what he's saying. I hate this. I hate it. I hate that these guys don't look for, obviously, LSU would be a tremendous opportunity. And there's going to be some people who choose to go to Mississippi State instead of LSU for a bigger bag, which is short-sighted, bad for that kid. Um, but he's going to go get paid now. And, you know, who knows? He may have pressure from his family to get that done. And, and he gets steered in the wrong direction. There's plenty of times that happens. I'm positive of it. Um, but, you know, I, I don't like it. I don't think this is the way it should be. But, uh, you know, this is what it is. And just like the Buckeyes needed to, after year two, it's either play ball or start to accept that you're going to take a step back in the hierarchy of football. If that's what LSU wants to do, I mean, it sounds like he's trying to lead him down that path to take a step back in the hierarchy of football, because what he's saying will work for some people, but uh, not not for all the people that he wants. And like you said, he's having problems getting defensive tackles, which, as we know, come at a premium. They're rare. They're big. They're rare individuals. It's where Texas said they're struggling. So he wants to take this stand. On maybe the position that most that people are paying the most for, um, on, on the defense for sure. It, I just, uh, I don't know, man. I, I think it's a horrible strategy. But if it does end up tanking him, couldn't happen to a nicer guy, right? Marcus Freeman had something to say that I found funny. Marcus said, I think Notre Dame's looking pretty good this year. I think they're looking good. Some people have them in their top five heading into the preseason. Um, I haven't done a top 25. I just might, uh, but I'll probably wait a little while. And I don't know where they'll be. I got to look a little further into them, but they look pretty doggone good. And uh, but Marcus is learning. I think he's learning, and I think he's going to keep getting better. But he said that every year you look at what you have, look at what you need, and talent-wise, you mold it together to make it run. I believe that this is probably, I want to say, my one of my most talented rosters I've had since I've been here. I found that pretty funny. He's been there now. This is year three. And he said, this is one of my most talented rosters. So, I mean, th this is your third, <laughs> one of your most talented. It, it, is it your most talented or not? I don't know. The Buckeye scholarship count currently sits at 80 scholarships. And that's without knowing any walk-ons. We had heard that it was at like 82 or 83, but I saw on Letterman Row, they had the full breakdown of all the positions and it's currently at 80, we don't know if guys like maybe a, an Inky Jones or a TC Caffey or uh, maybe a Pat Gurr or somebody gets a scholarship. But right now it's at 80. That's a good spot to be in. Um, I like that a lot. And I really am hoping that they sign a really big class uh, coming in here because, you know, you got to start adjusting the numbers that you bring in and expect the player atrophy. And, uh, you know, it's just going to happen with guys that realize they're not quite where they think they can play ever. And that's going to happen every year now and time to start planning for it, sign bigger classes. Um, and maybe, you know, the, the goal is to use the portal as little as possible and use it where you need it. So if that's the goal, then probably sign bigger classes is a good idea. Plus way more exciting to me anyway. Um, there was a, a really horrific story at, at the, the graduation at the stadium. And it appears that the woman who, who fell and died, the police said that they have ruled out an accident. So that's horrific. And her daughter was walking that day. So an absolutely horrible story. And I talked to, uh, I read an article about, the commencement speaker. Um, and my friend Doreen, I said, Hey, uh, you know, she was down there. I said, fill me in on this. Um, she was furious. She was furious. She said, everybody was furious. This guy, uh, Christopher Pan 
He's a social entrepreneur, musician, and inspirational speaker. And somehow he became the commencement speaker at Ohio State, who has had Barack Obama, George Bush, Tim Cook uh, speak at commencement in the past. They got this guy who graduated from the university in 1999, worked for Pepsi and Facebook, and then uh, started a company called My Intent, which makes bracelets with uh, with a customer to choose their word on it. That's what he does for a living. Um, somehow he got the gig. He also was recruited by the McKinsey Company, uh, who manufactured and marketed strategies to boost sales of opiates, painkillers, and, you know, n- terrible. But the, I don't, the guy doesn't sound like a good dude. Anyway. He is uh, referred to as Ted Carter in his statement as an incredible example of taking everything you've gained at Ohio State and applying it to find solutions to improve the world after graduation. As we celebrate commencement, I'm confident Chris will inspire our graduates to make their own impact as they blah, blah, blah. Uh, The dude said himself he was using psychedelics when he was giving the speech or writing the speech, I'm sorry, and he said that on social media. And off when they asked him to remove any references of Israel and Palestine in the speech. Um, I don't think that's a big ask with the threat of, I don't know, the, the protesting going on at the universities. I don't know if you saw, but they were doing it at the big house at Michigan and the whole procession of protesters rolled in like while they're doing graduation. Well, you know, I don't know to ask to leave it out at that particular time when there's all these protests going on probably a reasonable ask. He said he wanted to cancel, but they ended up working it out. Uh, He eventually got over it. So he goes up, gives the speech and starts singing four non-blondes. What's going on or what's up? And uh, the, the video of this is just incredible. This dude is up there, you know, take a deep breath and I get real high. I won't sing again. I sang yesterday, but you know what song it is. What's going on? You know what I mean? Hey, yeah. I love the song. I really do. Um, that The woman that sings that, the lead singer, weird, weird looking woman. I remember that video from when I was younger, but uh, she had some pipes, man. And that was a catchy tune. And apparently Chris Pan thought it was catchy too and decided to sing that. But that was just one of two songs he sang on the day. He also tried to sell the students on Bitcoin. Uh, teach him how to do something called box breathing, cited a parable. This is just like crazy. What he said about Bitcoin, <laughs> I know this might be polarizing, but I encourage you to keep an open mind right now. I see Bitcoin as a very misunderstood asset class. It's decentralized, it's finite, which means no government can print more at will. And in the early days of the exchanges, Bitcoin was prone to hacks of attacks and fraud, but this issue has been solved. With the recent launch of Bitcoin's EFTs backed, the world's two large, largest asset, asset managers, BlackRock and Fidelity, you can now hold these ETFs in your retirement accounts, just like your S&P 500. That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. It, it sounds like, is he in bed with Ted Carter? who he later revealed is a uh, sitting on the board of a carbon-free Bitcoin mining company? I don't know. How'd this guy get the gig? I don't know. Um, but that's really odd. He's hawking Bitcoin at this thing. Ted Carter's sitting on the board of that. I had high hopes for Ted Carter. But coming out and talking about this guy in the light that he did, um, geez, man, this is horrible. Absolute disaster. And the people were pissed absolutely furious so pretty crazy man but everybody's talking about it but uh a lot of people are talking about the callousness of you know this going on in the midst of the woman dying which is really just awful but who knows if he knew that or not i'm just saying like how does this happen i don't even blame this guy this guy's just a just a moron right like who let the moron get past the vetting process to get on the stage that's the people who who screwed up here. A, a moron is always going to be a moron. You know what I mean? Like, I don't expect him to not be a moron. He's just a moron. Um, it's the people who vet the guy, the people who previously vetted 
presidents of the United States of America. George W. Bush was a sitting flipping president giving the commencement speech. And somehow this dude gets the stamp of approval from uh, Teddy Carter. How does this happen? Horrible. Um, and it ruined a whole lot of people's day. And that sucks. You know, that's a one time thing. Um, so anyway, um, that's my show. Jeez, I shouldn't have ended on that note. Gosh, guys, I'm sorry. Hate to be a bummer. Listen, my uh, episode yesterday, College Football Traditions, got dinged with the copyright when it first came out. And what it does then is it sh shrivels up the circulation. Um, it doesn't get spread out to folks. And then I had to go back in when I got the notification, like hours later, because I was up till four finishing the thing. And uh, I release at eight. And I had to go change some stuff re-release it. It's not gotten a lot of views. Some of you haven't seen it, I'm sure. If you haven't and you like what I do, um, I promise you will like that one. It was one of my favorites that I've ever done. And uh, I think you should watch it if you like things I do. If you, if you don't, whatever. I'm just saying like, if you like my show at all, you will like that episode. And I would love for you to watch it because it's just one of the ones I'm more proud of. Some of them are great. Some of them are not so great today. Not so great. I don't have the best material to work with today. Um, I try my best. I shouldn't have. Maybe I'll cut this last part out. I, I shouldn't have got into this. This was just sad. And, and that's not really. That's, I don't want you guys sad. You come here to have fun and talk some football. You know, there's plenty of, plenty of sad people you can listen to. You can listen to politics if you want to be sad. Right? We have a strict no politics policy. In Juck on Bucks, because Juck on Bucks is a firm believer that politics should stay the hell out of sports. And somehow that has become a political statement in itself. But that's just where I stand on it. So Juck on Bucks will remain out of uh, politics and in sports. That's where I'll remain. You know why? Because we all got opinions on sports. We can argue about that. And it's more fun. Uh, and it doesn't cause us to hate each other. Well, sometimes it does. Anyway, guys. Um, catch me on, uh, on podcast. If you want to once in a while, when you're working out, uh, you would be pretty, Oh, I got something else to tell you. Oh my goodness. Do I got something to tell you? How do I forget this one? Check this out. Um, so there is a podcast, right? There's a podcast and it is an Ohio state podcast. I'm not going to name them because they took a whole lot of crap today and I don't want to send any more their way. Um, they made a stupid choice, right? Uh, and it wasn't a choice that hurts anybody, but they chose to have, you know, this baby Gronk kid, right? They call him baby Gronk. I, I thought this story was long dead. It feels like it started two years ago. Just some big young kid was a football player. His dad pushed it, pushed it, pushed the story. Obviously one of these dads that tries to get his kid to go viral he was successful. It went viral. It kept rolling. And uh, I, I hadn't heard anything about him forever. And out of the blue today, uh, I see that uh, these dudes who do an Ohio State podcast, I know nothing of the podcast other than it has 16 subscribers. Um, and they posted that they interviewed this guy, the dad and the son, Baby Gronk. And the Buckeye Nation went in on these dudes. I mean, it was like, I hope you get deplatformed type of stuff over interviewing this guy. And I'm like, what did I miss here? Did it come out or something? That this guy's like an abusive dad? Like, that's what I'm thinking. No, that's not what happened. Everybody was legitimately that mad that somehow they felt like he was associating this baby Gronk with the program. Now, I would never interview baby Gronk. But there's a reason I don't have 16 subscribers, right? Like a little common sense. However, they've got no common sense. Clearly, that doesn't mean they're bad guys. Doesn't mean they don't deserve to be platformed. Um, I don't know, man. It made me feel kind of bad. It made me feel real bad. Uh, so, you know, guys, listen, here's the thing. It's not always easy to come up with with things to talk about and content that you feel is worth putting out there. But sometimes people who watch you want you to put something out there anyway. And you got these things where it's like, well, 
I want my standards to be up here, but I know they would like to watch something and, and I don't want them to forget about me. So it's always this kind of balancing act. I go through it all the time, uh, particularly some weeks. There's, there's just nothing to talk about, right? There's nothing going on except for little tiny tidbits. Um, I could come on and read the news and there's a lot of things I could do just to keep myself out there, but I don't feel like it would be good quality stuff. So I don't, but when you get an opportunity to do an interview with someone you think that people are going to like, and that's clearly what these guys thought, they thought that people were going to like this, like be like, oh, that's cool. They made a, they made a big miscalculation, but come on, have a heart, man. It's not easy. I, I promise you, it's not easy. So if you're someone who, uh, who, who was blasting those guys, um, you know, I'm sure they feel like complete fools and, um, I'm not even going to say rightfully so it was just a mistake. You know, it was a mistake and, uh, and, and I really felt bad for them. Uh, however, the way the world works today, my guess is they're going to pick up some subscriptions from that. So maybe it's all good in the end. Who knows? You know, not everybody's a professional. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, people make dumb choices. Um, I've made plenty. I've made plenty. Uh, I appreciate that none of you have called to have me deplatformed except for Michael. Michael, Michael wants me deplatformed except I'm about that. <laughs> I am the sickest college football fan on the earth, man. Jeez, oh, Pete, this guy hates me. My goodness. Notre Dame, the Holy Grail. Listen, here's the thing. I love the tradition of Notre Dame. Absolutely love it. I don't love the sign. That's all. So. Yo, guys, you there? I lost you. These guys there? Guys, I can't see you. Anyway, guys, that's my show now for real. All right. So um, I am going, what's today? It's Wednesday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, traveling to South Kakalaki. We just talked about South Kakalaki yesterday. I'll be in South Kakalaki, not in Columbia. Columbia is kind of a, yeah. <laughs> Um, except for the campus. It's a little, yeah. Um, I will be in Hilton Head, which is essentially um, Ohio East, right? Like Hilton Head is like Ohio East. And it, it, it's weird how Hilton Head is, if you've ever been, I'm sure many of you had, because like you go there and you see Ohio license plates everywhere. People have the the lighthouse at Harbor Town with Ohio on the bumper sticker all over the place. It's crazy how that happens. But I've got to go to a wedding at the Harbor Town Clubhouse, which I'm quite excited. I played that about 15 years ago. Um did not break 100 on Harbor Town. That was really tough, but uh but I played it. It was fun. Um it was expensive, probably a lot more expensive now, so I'm not playing it this time. But I am going to be at a wedding at Harbor Town. I will bring my stuff. We'll do at least one or two remote shows from there. Um, and uh, who knows? Maybe uh, but I'll definitely see you before then anyway. So anyway, thanks guys. Jugging bucks out.